We are continuing in our series on the harvesters, where Jesus is preparing his men to serve in the field. And this is uh, part three of the view from heaven. Jesus has been reassuring his harvesters, we'll talk about that a little bit, but he's been reassuring his harvesters about the apparent disaster that he'd been describing. Remember, there's, there's seven parables in Matthew 13. And the first four are not very cheery. This, is, this looks like it's, why would we want to go do this? Why would we pray to go do this? It's just going to turn into a debacle. But Jesus then takes them to the, to the inside. You know, He draws his people in close and he explains things to them that they wouldn't have known otherwise. He gives them a completely different perspective. And uh, there's a story. It's about these two hard rock miners. They had their, their claim and they've been digging for a while and they had, a, they had a, a, a hole they bored into this rock face of a mountain and they were sinking a shaft. And as they were seeing it, and there's all these signs. There's lots of quartz, and there's lots of lots of minerals that are telling there's got to be gold nearby here. But they weren't seeing it yet. They've been digging for quite a while, and and uh, maybe their grub stake was running out a little bit there, and they're they're a little concerned. We're going to be able to keep doing this, and and so they got a little impatient, and they put too much dynamite down in their shaft, and off it goes, and it didn't just blow a hole down there. It pulled the whole ceiling down out of their their. They're bored all the way down into this shaft and filled it and piled up. Oh, no. So they're looking at this thing, and they didn't really know how to handle this problem. It presented some real issues. So they, they went into town, and they found a mining engineer, and they asked him to come out and look at the hole. You know, how can we fix this? How can we shore it up? You know, is it even worth it? I mean, you can imagine the, the disappointment he's been felt. All this work. So, I mean, the, the, their, their hole was pretty full, so this, this engineer gets his lamp, and he goes in, and he climbs up on top of all the rubble, and he goes in, he's gone for a while. And so they're waiting outside, because they know it's unsafe, but he's willing to go in. So he comes back out, and they said to him, so... Um, can we fix this? He says, it doesn't need to be fixed. You know, they can look in the hole. It's full of rocks. It doesn't need to be fixed. Okay. And he had this funny look on his face. He had this, this kind of a cheery look. I mean, he's a cheery guy anyway, but he just had this cheery look on his face. So, he says, I think you need to see something. So he leads them in, they're crawling over these big boulders and all this rock, you know, and it's, it's a hard climb, and they get way back in there, just about where the shaft was. And he says, uh, and, he, and he said, you know, this, there's nothing here, this is a waste. He says, uh, he takes his lamp, you know, those carbide lamps, he takes his lamp, and he says, look up. And at the top, there's this open dome with a four-inch stripe of gold running all the way from edge to edge. That was a pretty good day. <laughs> but they had to look up. They had been spending their time looking at the disaster and the rubble on the ground. And somebody had to point out, hey, <clears throat> and shine a light on it and look up. Oh, maybe it wasn't a disaster after all. Thirteen forty-seven. Again, he says. Now he said again twice. Remember, there's three parables here, and when he strings them together with again, that means we should pay attention. It's all together. It's all together. So we're supposed to see these as a unit, as one thing. And actually, all of chapter 13 is this, uh, all of these parables is this single prophetic discourse that Jesus is doing. And the first four, as you remember, are, he, are in parables because the crowd have estranged themselves from God. They're not interested. They're not listening. And so he gives it to them in parables. So unless they know who God is and they're going to follow and believe him, they're not going to see through 
the, the mist of, of the parable. But those who have ears to hear and eyes to see can figure this out. And then he pulls them to the inside and he gives them these, these last three. And boy, does that change the perspective. Basically, he's telling them, look up. Just look up. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So we've got these seven parables that are in specific order. It's a, it's a specific prophetic order. We've kind of talked about that. The four look like a disastrous failure. The next three, um, Jesus brings them close and explains to them. And, and the, the, the fifth one is about God's plan for Israel. It's about the, the field, remember? There's this field. And this man finds a treasure. It's on the earth. He lifts it out of the earth. It's recognized. It's there. But it's not ready. And so he puts it back into the earth and rehides it. And there it stays. And that's the end of that parable. And then he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And he finds this one amazing pearl. And he sells all that he has, and he buys it. You remember that, that beautiful picture? And the first, the first parable about the, about the field is about Israel. And the second one is about the church. And isn't it fascinating that a pearl is, if we may put it this way, a Gentile precious stone? Right? Because it comes from an unclean animal under the sea. Right? And so this is, this is not something of interest to the Jews. And that's one of the clues that this thing is, is really about the church. So then he comes to this last one. And there's a bunch of elements here. And now he's talking about this dragnet cast into the where? The sea. And the sea is a picture of what? The Gentile nations. Right? And so... And it's all of these nations that are in rebellion. And so, this dragnet, a dragnet is a little bit different. I mean, there's lots of different kinds of nets. But a dragnet is one that, you, I'm not a fisherman, so maybe you guys could correct me. Um, my brother-in-law is a professional fisherman. I should have called him. I just should have called him. But anyway, because they still use basically the same kinds of nets. So it, there hasn't been a new one really invented. And so, it, it goes down to the bottom, and it just you just leave it down there. You don't... You don't throw it and catch it, pull it up. You leave it down there for a while, and it fills up with fish. And then you drag it to the shore. So this is what, this is what the picture is. So there's a picture of a net, and he's, he's comparing the kingdom of heaven to a net this time. And remember, the kingdom of heaven is not a location. It's not a building. It's not an organization, per se. It is, it is anywhere the name of Christ has been honored. That doesn't necessarily mean that, it is, that he is obeyed there. Maybe a, a, the best parallel term that we have to this, to the kingdom of heaven, would be Christendom. Mm -hmm. Christ has been proclaimed, at least in the Western Hemisphere, for a long, long time. And now it's, it's spreading to the third world, and it's, it's thank you for the, the missionary efforts in the, in the 1800s, largely. But uh, they're saying right now, according to uh, Steve Turley, one of my... One of my dear in informants, he says that the gospel now is spreading, uh, the, the population in Africa is exploding. In, in southern Africa, below the Sahara, it is, the population is exploding. But the percentage of, uh, or the number of believers is exceeding the growth of the population. What does that tell you? That there are new conversions happening by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. So it's spreading very quickly. And so um, this net, this kingdom of heaven, is also now spreading in those places. And there's, it's very difficult to get numbers, but it appears that there is a revival going on, or an awakening is really a more technical term, going on in China, that is probably, potentially, because of the population numbers, the largest expansion of the church in church history. Period. If you're counting raw numbers. Uh, Iran has this amazing church that's been spreading. It began largely among women. Because here's a country who's had a generation or two of, of Islam, and they don't seem to like it so much. And so they turned to Christ. At considerable cost, by the way. Yeah. Affected their life. Yeah. Yeah. And they take their life in some very ugly ways. So... So the kingdom of heaven, Christendom, anywhere Christ is proclaimed, is, is like a net 
It catches good fish. It also catches some bad fish. And the net is made of the harvesters. You and I. Anyone who is a part of the gospel, anyone who has faith in Christ, we are the woven cords. We are the strands twisted together, which kind of describes some of us, doesn't it? A little, little twisted here and there, but we love them anyway. And so we are twisted and bent together to form this mesh. And in that, then, the fish come. So, Jesus likes to use the net. This is a picture. And the net is made of the harvesters. Jesus uses his servants. Have you noticed that? He, know, he uses his servants. I remember that, and we see this all through the, all through the Gospels. Where, um, remember he turns the water into wine? The first miracle, the beginning of his ministry, it says in John. And he turns the water into wine. And he doesn't just, just do it. There's these, these six, which is really interesting. Six, still not seven. I'm not going to exposit this, and I would love to open up that miracle. It is astonishing, but I, I won't. <laughs> six stone pots, not seven. So it's, it's one short. It's incomplete. Hmm. And he has the servants fill it with water. And then he has the servants draw the water out, right? And then the servants take it to the head, the head guy of the feast. And so he's using, he, he never touches it, hands off. Nothing. Nothing up my sleeve. He never touches a thing of it, right? And so he uses the servants to do all this thing. When he's feeding the 5,000, we'll look at that probably, probably in the next few weeks. But when he's feeding the 5,000, he says, you know, these guys need to go, uh, they need to be fed. They need to go. And Jesus says, feed them yourself. <laughs> they must have laughed. <laughs> what? <laughs> we can't feed this many people. What, what, what do you got? Isn't that amazing? What do you got? We get so up, we get so up you, so, so full of ourselves. We think that somehow we have to have the resources or, or that we have the resources in our hands anyway. Even the ones that we have, we, we think either they're not enough or we couldn't use it for this or that. And God turns, this, turns our resources into amazing things. And so he takes, he takes just the food that they had. And so then who distributed the food? The disciples, the disciples right? Servants. And who gathered the pieces when it was over? The servants. So the, and the disciples. And he does it again when he feeds the, the 4,000. So this is, this is a pattern for him. And you know, this, you know the story in Luke chapter 5, where Jesus is getting to know the disciples. He hasn't really called them out into service yet. And so he's standing by the, the shore, and the disciples have been fishing, right? Peter and company, they've been, they've been fishing. And he says to them, children, <laughs> did you catch any fish? No. We've been, we've been laboring all night long. We'll, we'll put the net on the other side of the boat. I love this net picture. Yeah. And so you can hear the attitude. <laughs> There's a little edge of attitude here. Look, we have been fishing all night long. We haven't caught a thing. But because you said, put the... <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> yeah, but we're going to yield. That's what they're doing. They're human. Oh, but we're going to put the net on the other side. Because I'm sure, I'm sure there, are, there is a whole host of fish just waiting to snuggle into our nice warm nets only eight feet away where we've been fishing all night before. So they do it. And then the nets fill up, and the boats are so full of fish that they're about to sink. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. Now, we, we, not, we shouldn't kid ourselves that all of this, all of this is from the Holy Spirit. It's not us. We cannot raise a soul from the dead and give them eternal life any more than we can turn lead into gold. This is something that only God can do. He wants us to participate. He wants us to be part of the, of, the, of the effort. He wants us to be there. I think in part, if nothing else, uh, if nothing else, because it's so much fun. Have you ever led someone to Christ? What? There, I, I don't have words for that. The joy. I don't have words for that. What an amazing experience to see somebody's life transformed. And maybe you don't see it right there in, the, in that second at the moment, but in a week, you start seeing significant differences in this person's life, and their heart changes. It's, it's an amazing thing. So, it's the Holy Spirit that, that empowers us, 
And so there's this net, and it's thrown into the sea, and it's the nations and the Gentiles and, and God's mercy. And this is the shocker for them, because you have to put yourself in the shoes of these men. These were Jewish men. And here, all of a sudden, Jesus is telling them that the Gentiles are going to be coming in. Now, they, they'd heard this in Isaiah, but you know how it is when you read Jew as things in the Bible, you don't believe it. This is too good to be true. You guys got really quiet there. Am I the only one that does that? <laughs> yeah, come on, right, yeah. Well, yeah, I know all those stories, uh, you know, creation and uh, Daniel and the lion's den. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure it was... No, really. Really. This is concrete reality. Eyewitnesses saw this stuff. This is written in scripture that's preserved miraculously through the history of the world so that we can possess this. And so, as, he, as, as Jesus is taking this kingdom and cast this net into the nations, Revelation tells us that there will be people from every tongue and tribe and nation will be there. All kinds of fish. Do you see that in this parable? Mm -hmm. Gathering fish of every kind. And the fish are the souls. The fish are the souls, all nations. And, and Peter, Peter, interestingly enough, at the end of this, this um, of Luke's account of, you know, put the, put the net on the other side of the boat. Really? So they fill the boat with fish. They get... I don't know how they got the boats and the fish to shore, but somehow they did. That part of the story is left out. But I would imagine they were pretty, <laughs> working pretty hard. So they get it there. And so Peter throws himself at, at Jesus' feet and says, I am a sinful man. Depart from me. Why is he telling Jesus what to do? Because he's realizing who Jesus is, that this is God. And Peter has no place to go. Where would he run to hide from God? Where could he go to be out of his presence? Well, he's not worthy to be in God's presence. So he asked Jesus to move back. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not sure I quite follow the logic of that, but that is the logic. That's the thinking. And so Jesus says, <clears throat> Jesus says to him, the DLT inserts, um, take it for what it's worth, that, yeah, you caught a lot of fish here. But I will make you fishers of men. It's about souls. Mm -hmm. It's always about the souls. Back in, in, in the end of John, where, where Jesus makes a special trip to go do a counseling session. Jesus was an excellent counselor. Jesus shows up to do therapy with, with Peter because he's denied him three times and he's completely shut down. And he can't even admit to himself that he loves Jesus. He's that shut down. So Peter shows up. Or Jesus shows up. And he has them fish. They've seen this dance before, right? Same thing happens. It fills with the, the nets fill when they've got nothing. And so they, they get all of that, and, and, and Peter, you know, he's, he's in the water like a, like a torpedo, gets to Jesus. And, and he gets to the, the, the shore. Remember what's waiting on the shore? Right. Fire and fish. Yeah, fire and fish breakfast. Yeah, fire and fish. Translation, Peter. If I need you to be a fisherman, I'll make you a fisherman. I don't need fish. What we're after here is souls. They caught a whole boat full of fish. We don't need the fish. It's not about the fish. I got fish. If I want fish, I'll make fish. This is about souls. When it was filled, the fullness of of the Gentiles, when it was filled. You know, these little details in these parables are often easy to just jump over because, of course, you put a, a net in the water, it's supposed to fill with fish as part of the story, so we just, we just kind of miss this, right? But I want you to look at something. Look at Romans chapter 11. Aha, Romans. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 11. We'll pick it up in verse 25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. This is, this is so wonderful. So when this, when, this, when this net is filled, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until what? Fullness. The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so, and then he says, and so, and we need to, to we need to, to get that then. And so, looking to the future, what's the next thing? All the fullness of the net. The net is filled. And so when the net is filled, they drew it up on the beach. Now, this is interesting. Now, up to this point, Jesus has been the actor all the time, the person uh, making things happen, correct? The, the, the activator. And so he's been the farmer sowing the seed. He's been uh, twice. You know, the first one is, is, is the, four, the four soils. The next one is the one where it gets sabotaged with, with the tares, right? And the third one is, do you remember the third one? Mustard seed. Mustard seed, yes. And then, which turns into monstrosity, right? And then the next one is a woman. So we've got a saboteur who shows up. We've already had a saboteur in the second one, right? When, when Satan shows up and sows false believers, um, hypocrites and artificial people who never really believed. And they are to crowd out and, and, imit, and damage the, the crop. And so, so up to this point, Jesus has been the actor. And then with the, the, the treasure in the field, it's Jesus who goes and finds, correct? Mm -hmm. And with the, the merchant who's looking for a great pearl, it is Jesus who goes and finds it. But here, here, the pronoun changes. They. They. Well, gee, there's, there's just one Jesus, right? I know he's part of the Trinity, so don't make this thing walk on all, all, all fours. But um, they. Who, who, who is this they? Us? No. Nope. But it's easy to go there, isn't it? But no. We'll see you in a minute. So, wasn't that fun? We'll just hang on. <laughs> so the next thing is these, these fish are gathered, and they're stored in containers. And um, the good ones are stored in containers. The others are what? They're thrown away. And so we need, to, we need to look at this carefully. He's going to explain this in some more detail in a minute. But here's something I want you to get. Whoever the they may be, it's not us. It's not the church. And the church, believers, we are never commanded to purge out bad people. That is not our job. The tares were, were supposed to stay there with everybody else and just let them grow together. And then at the harvest, what happens? The angels come and gather them up, bundles of them, and where do they, and what happens next? They are taken away into the fire, and so then the believers are left. But the wicked, the rebellious, those who hate God, who have no interest in God, are taken away and thrown into the fire. And there, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That is a frightening picture. But through church history, we've seen some really destructive churchianity things take place. The church is not commanded to purge itself of bad fish. We are to keep our gatherings pure from rebellious sin. We are to make disciples. And we are to be free of false teachers. That's it. Outside of that, we are just to keep calm and carry on. That's all our responsibility. We are not supposed to go out and fix all the, the false teaching in the world, or we're, we're not to, to judge the, the tares, we're not to burn heretics at the stake, we're not to torture confessions until we, get, we hear what we want to hear, we aren't to exile anybody, persecute anybody. When the church has missed this, when the kingdom of heaven under Christendom has missed this, brutal, bloody things have happened. We chose to see ourselves more as an organization, and we hadn't seen ourselves as simply the place where souls dwell that name the name of Christ as their Savior. And so it's created incredible confusion. One of the reasons it's so difficult to reach Jewish people now is because of the anti-Semitism that came up under this behavior. It's one time, it's not just that the Jewish man's heart is, is hardened, it's been paved is the way the church has behaved. So, it's not our job to do those things. Verse 49. 
Now Jesus explains what's really going on here. We could guess at some of these other details, but Jesus doesn't leave his men in that situation. He explains what's going on. Verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth. That's the they. That's who they are. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. Don't miss that pattern. We're going to look at that in a minute. We'll take the wicked from out from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's the angels. And herein, in this, these two verses, we see the essence of this parable. The essence of this parable is about separation. And note this pattern. The wicked are taken away, and the elect, the chosen, remain. Now, there's a whole bunch of, of patterns. We find a whole bunch of them. I just have a few modest examples here. Noah's flood. Noah's flood. They were put into a container. We could call it that, right? A, a large container, but it was a container. And then the flood came and washed everyone away. And so the elect, the chosen, remained. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, pick up verse 40. I'm looking forward to getting to Matthew 24, but that's going to be a while. <laughs> yeah, this space. It's going to be a while. <laughs> Matthew 24, picking up verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here's the Christ, there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, wherever the corpse is, there will the vultures be. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds and the sky with power and great glory. And he will lead forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from the end of the sky to the other. And what we see immediately after that, when we look down at the rest of the chapter from 42 on, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip, just kind of summarize it. What happens then is that all those remaining, the elect, those who are alive, remain there, and the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire. They are taken out and cast away. Now, this is not the rapture. This is not the rapture. One other illustration. Remember, remember in Isaiah, we talked a little bit about this Wednesday, because I was getting too carried away, but we did talk a little bit about it. One of the central events, maybe the central event, of the book of Isaiah is in chapter 36, where the Assyrians are, are, are sieging Jerusalem, and there's almost nothing left of the Jewish nation. It's just a remnant, but there will always be a remnant. And so they are, they are whole up in Jerusalem behind the walls. And, and they're threatening, and they're going to come in, they're going to destroy them. And so God sends an angel and destroys 185,000 troops, and they're dead. Now most, there were whole nations in those days that didn't have that much population. So the Assyrian war machine was like a steamroller. There was nothing to stop them. And so... The wicked were destroyed, yes, except God. The wicked were destroyed, and who's left? The elect. The same pattern. That's the pattern we see in this. So he's not talking about the rapture. And he says in the beginning of verse 49, he says, So it will be at the end of the age. Now this is part of where we get into, into dispensational theology, which is very helpful and, and makes things so much clearer. So, anyway... So this is the end of the age. What, which age? 
Well, it is the age of the rule of the Gentiles, and it ends at the close of the Great Tribulation. That's when it ends. Okay? So we've, we've talked about Daniel chapter 9, 25, and, and 26, where he's talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel, maybe one of the most famous passages in, in the Bible, or at least certainly the most core, central, prophetic passage in, in Scripture. And so it talks about the 69 weeks. He talks about seven weeks, then he talks about another 62 weeks, and I think that's 69, right? Using higher math, right? And so 69 weeks out of 70, and those 70 weeks pertain to Israel and the rule of the Gentiles globally. And so at the end of that 69th week, it says the Messiah will be cut off, meaning he's, he dies. They weren't really paying attention to that because they seemed to think that this Messiah would be the king and they would be they would be ruling the world forever, forevermore. But they weren't picking up the details. So we see that Jesus, the Messiah, fits all the description. And so the Messiah is crucified at the end of the 69th week. Then there's this gap. And that's where the church fits in for 2,000 years. But the 70th week starts after after the church is removed from the earth. You with me on this? You guys, are, you guys are catching up on the theology here. We've gone over this a few times. But the, it's important for us to know this. But we know from Thessalonians that the Holy Spirit, well, excuse me, from, from John 14, that the Holy Spirit will be given by Jesus after the resurrection, be given, given by Jesus to the church. This, this is really the age, it's called the church age, but it's often the, it should be called the age of the Holy Spirit. And so when the Spirit is removed, and he will be removed because the man of, of, of disobedience, the, the beast, cannot be re revealed as long as the Spirit is present. And so he's revealed, but if we are to be with him forever, then we go with him. And we have that described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That there'll be a shout, there'll be a trumpet, and so and we will meet the Lord in the air. Now this is, this is not Jesus coming back, we're meeting him in the air. He's not here. This is not a, a coming. This is a flyby. Can we call it that? And so we are caught up with him to be with him. And once that happens, then literally all hell breaks loose on earth. The, the, the Antichrist appears. He makes a deal with Israel. He brings world peace through a world religion, which is centered on a city that has seven hills. This is all prophetic. What city has seven hills? So what religion are we talking about? Right? It tells us this. And so, I mean, there's lots of offerings, but let's say with Scripture, okay? There's lots of speculation, but this is what he's describing. And so, at, at that point, the, at three and a half years into this seven-year period, halfway through, he, he betrays Israel, cuts his ties, destroys the, this religion, because he doesn't need it anymore, and manifests himself as basically Satan incarnate. <coughs> And then it gets really ugly. And we have the bowls from Revelation poured out and the trumpets blown and, and evil is now being purged from the earth. But before that happens, before that, we have the rapture and we're pulled away. So that's, a, that's the opposite pattern, isn't it? The elect are removed, the wicked remain. With me? So this parable is not talking about the same period of time. It's talking about the last period of time, over the end, the, well, the next to the last, where that, that age of, of Gentile rule is broken. So at the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns and sets up a reign. The wicked are killed. His people, Israel, are either those that are surviving have turned to Christ by the, by the thousands in mass. It's very interesting. Is Israel's back in the land, right? We remind you of that once in a while. Israel's back in the land, and right now, there seems to be some kind of stirring of the gospel, especially in the land of Israel, where people are turning to Christ. It was estimated 10 or 15 years ago that there may have been no more than 3,000 to 5,000 uh, Messianic Jews in, in Israel that actually lived there. Now the numbers are more like 30 to 40,000. It's jumping, just in the last few years. So whatever it is that you're up to that you know you shouldn't be, you know, Jesus may be picking you up pretty soon in the flyby, okay? So uh, you might want to clean that up. Anyway, <laughs> you think 
I'm kidding. I remember hearing one time, I, I heard this, this preacher um, talking about some of the things that God was telling the nation of Israel, that if you, if you pursue idolatry, I will close up the heavens, it will not rain, and you will blow away like weeds and dust. And at that point, the preacher says, God isn't kidding. <laughs> Something about that phrase just got through to me. God isn't kidding. He meant what he said. And so far, biblical prophecy comes true, letter perfect, every single time. God isn't kidding. So, so the second advent at the end of the tribulation picks up. Oh, there's so much to talk about here. Look at Revelation 19. We'll go there. Revelation 19. Notice it's not called Revelations. It's Revelation. It's one big one. With a whole bunch of facets to it, but it's one big one. Picking up at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on his cold, faithful and true, and in righteous righteousness. Do you hear that? In righteousness he judges and wages war. What does righteousness mean? What is that? Is it doing the right things and not doing the wrong things? No. no. What is it? Being right with God. Being right with God. She always answers this. Can you guys... <laughs> righteousness is not a description of your of your actions. Righteousness is a character trait. It is something that's created in you when you're born again. It is resonant with God because he is righteous altogether, right? <coughs> and righteousness is to be right and pure with God, and this character quality then reaches out to others in love and mercy. That's what righteousness is. That's why in Romans, <laughs> Romans it says in chapter 3 that, that the righteousness of God is manifested in the gospel. And then it says in chapter 3 that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. One of my favorite passages in the whole New Testament, that he might be just. There's the purity and the justifier. There's the reaching out in love and mercy. Right there. That is the gospel. So, but notice, we don't, see, we don't think of the, the judge coming as, as righteous. We, we think of his coming as a warrior, as, as one who's going to slaughter. But he's coming in love and mercy. He's coming in love and mercy. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. How does one wage war in love and mercy? Because you're coming to deliver the elect from the wicked. It's a rescue operation. People ask us, when you put on the, 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 the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, is this defensive armor or is it offensive armor? Yes. That's a dumb question. It's actually, sorry, I shouldn't, shouldn't insult the crowd. They won't come back. But it's really, it's really a quote from Isaiah 59. He's distilling some things out of Isaiah 59. Paul was not sitting in some Roman cell chained to a, a Roman guard and saying, oh, well, there's a real illustration and, and talking about all this stuff. It's, he's, he's, he's Jewish. He, know, he doesn't need a Roman to explain the word of God to him. He's got Isaiah. And it talks about how he puts on this breastplate of, of he's called righteousness, but he puts on a breastplate of salvation, a helmet of salvation. This is what he's putting on. And so those, those, the armor for spiritual warfare is to equip us so we are able to reach out as part of the net and save souls. It's about reaching out to others in love and mercy, especially those who cannot save themselves. So, I'm going to preach, got to go back off. Okay, okay. Twelve. His his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. That's that's a, a ring, kind of a crown, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the enemies which are in heaven, clothed in and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads on treads the winepress of, 
the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So who is this? Jesus. Jesus. Obviously. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized. Now notice the pattern, taking the wicked away. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, with which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, we must, we must be released for a short time. And at that point, the millennial reign of Christ starts. The angels are this army that are backing him up, and they are the ones that cast the wicked into the fire. It isn't us. We don't have to do that job. And in that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. We've already seen it before in just a few verses above, in verse 40, right? 40 to 42. And we see it in Matthew 24, 51, where the, the judgment is taking place. Gnashing is interesting. Now, we first, first when we read it, I remember when I was younger and I was reading this thing, and, and I think, oh gosh, there's so much pain, you know? Gnashing, uh, that's not what that means. Gnashing is, is, a, is being enraged, a murderous anger, a hatred, deep to like the pit of your soul kind of hatred. And it's expressed in and we see when Stephen was speaking to the to the, the leaders, and he's describing Jesus to them, and, and he says, I see Christ in heaven, and they gnash their teeth at him. So we think, oh, it's it's so it seems so unfair that they would be thrown into judgment. They hate God. They hate God. And they resent that they were held accountable. It's a chilling thing. Now, so this parable, this parable does not apply to the dispensation of the church. This parable actually applies to Israel. But remember, context, context, context. The twelve were Israelites, and it appears to their people, and the promise is given to their forefathers, so that they will know. What Jesus is doing, remember, he's reassuring them. And there is a hope through knowing we are part of something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our nation, bigger than our traditions. And the Messiah had a very different perspective on the drama of human history than those men did, than we ourselves do. I think we get awfully comfortable sometimes and think we've got it all figured out, and we know how things ought to go. Well, they did the same thing, and they had some rude awakenings. So that was a very hard thought for them to accept. But now we know the long view. And knowing the long view gives us comfort. Something to reassure ourselves with. Now, like them, like them, on this side of, but this, on this side of the rapture, however, like them, we fear for the endurance of our nation. Do we not? There are some words spoken a while ago that are very relevant. Four score. And seven years ago. 
our forefathers brought forth, forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the principle that all men are created equal. Now, he said, we are in a great civil war testing whether such a nation or any nation consecrated to that principle and dedicated so can long endure. We find ourselves in a very similar conflict. The details are different. We do not know how this crisis will end. But then we must keep in mind that there is a bigger conflict here, one that is more precious than the survival of any political system, even ours. To see that great conflict, that higher priority, we must look up to that divine vein of gold mm -hmm. glittering above the rubble and the chaos. <laughs> Whatever outcome of our crisis, we must remain vigilantly aware of God's perspective of history and his plan of salvation in the kingdom of heaven. We must think bigger than our nation, more broadly than our nation, and allow God's greater purpose to set the course of our life through the difficult waters we are navigating in our current political crisis. We must not lose sight of our current service to God as harvesters. Even if the world we know and love seems to be coming apart around us. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above where Christ is, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus was saying, I think you might want to see this. Look up. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this amazing glimpse into a dim and frightening future. And we have this sense that that frightening future is not very far away. But thank you for your amazing righteousness that you knew we would be afraid, and yet you took the time and the expertise to explain to us in easily remembered words what our hope actually is. That you have a plan for Israel. They're waiting, latent in the soil, waiting. And you will return to them. But for now, we are this pearl of great price. And there will come a time when you return and sweep away the wicked and establish your kingdom for a thousand years. And then you will judge all of it and we will have a new heavens and a new earth. And your city will descend from heaven and we will be revealed with you in glory forever and ever. It's in Jesus' precious and faithful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.